request you to ask two questions. Yes, sir. Before that, I love you so much. Ah. Oh, you just… Oh, he just broke my heart. Sadhguru, my uh, first question is, um, I'm not able to pull out uh, myself from the grief. Like, you know, whenever I see a child begging on the street, girl or a boy, I just… my conscience just keeps biting me like, you know, you are not doing this for them, you are not doing that for them. So, um, then I talk to myself saying that if I could earn unlimited, I could do so many things for them. So, I want to… I don't know how to get out of this… Uh, fe this feeling. Whenever I see, I just, you know, my legs start walking towards them and uh, I… I just uh, spoil the mood for myself. So, how to… how to… how to be practical, like how… it's too much of emotion which is disturbing me. You see, uh, there is an unfortunate reality in the world, particularly in our country, where uh, many people have not eaten properly. A lot of children still go to bed without food in their stomach. This is a reality. But today, there is some encouraging news because United Nations has made a study and shows in the last decade, that is from 2006 to 2016, they made a study and they said, about 270 million people in the country have come out of the poverty line in the last ten hours, ten years rather, in the last decade. It's a fantastic news, isn't it? You're not saying anything, huh? In this country where over 1.4 million children were dying of malnutrition before they become five years of age has come down by nearly uh, 430,000, still 970,000 are dying, but we must celebrate the success, very important. Because everything needs a momentum, success needs a momentum. If you grieve over things which are bad, you will give momentum to those things which are bad. You must give momentum to those things which are solution. Don't give momentum to the problems, give momentum to the solutions that are happening. And the choice that you and me have is just this, do we want to be a part of the problem or do you want to be a part of the solution? This is all the choice we have. Now, let us say ten people are miserable here. More than ten faces are looking miserable. <laughs> let us say ten people are miserable here and uh, because I see these ten faces, I will also become miserable. miserable. Have I solved something or have I added to the problem? Added to the problem, now there are eleven miserable people. So it's very, very important that if we want solutions, we must go beyond our natural, you know, reactive emotions that we have towards various things and look beyond that and see what is the solution. For that solution we must strive continuously. Will the solutions happen immediately? No. Maybe it'll not happen in our lifetime. But are we a part of the solution? Always are we a part of the solution? Will all of you young girls take this stand in your life? You will always be a part of the solution. Hello? Always. No matter in what situation you are, whatever the situation of your life, it could be personal, it could be social, it could be national. You are always a part of the solution. You will not take sides with problems. Hello? Yes. This one thing you take in your life, you will see, you will know the joy of unfolding all your capacity. When you're part of the problem, your possibilities will not come out. When you're part of the solution, you will do things that you never imagined you could do in your life, simply because you will unfold into that possibility. So just become part of the solution. This does not mean you are the solution, no. Because there are people busy always creating new problems, 
If you solve one problem, they create a new problem. This happened. Can I tell you a joke? You all right? You're not too serious for that? No. A woman in Tennessee, you know our center in the United States is in Tennessee. So uh, a woman in Tennessee was marrying for the fifth time. So she was uh, just a day away from marriage, she was having dinner with her fiancé. And she served him mushroom soup and he took in a spoon and uh, nice candlelight and romantic and everything. Then uh, he asked, how did your first husband die? Uh, she said, well, he ate poison mushrooms and died. Okay. How did your second husband die? Oh, he also ate poison mushrooms and died. Now he kept the spoon there. But how did the third one die? Oh, in fact, he also ate poison mushrooms and died. Now he got terrified. He asked, how did your fourth husband die? Well, he died of a broken neck because he refused to eat poison mushrooms. <laughs> So what do you want to have? <laughs> Let's be part of the solution. We are not the solution on this planet. We are part of the solution. We are adding to the solution, we are giving energy and strength to the solution, that's all. Will we solve everything? No. But we must have the fulfillment in our life that we have been a part of the solution, not part of the problem. How did you fall in love with me? Social media love, is it? <laughs> we see uh, that people who want to have children but are unable to conceive one themselves invest a lot of time, energy and money into fertility treatments when there are so many kids around the world uh, who are waiting to be adopted. Uh, I understand that adoption is not the cure for uh, infertility it is though the cure for childlessness. So if the purpose is to uh, rear a child, have a child, love a child, provide a home, why not just adopt a child who's already waiting for a home and to be loved? See, uh, already many doctors and organizations are uh, trolling me and putting me on fire because I said first thing in India is you must close down this, all these damn fertility clinics. When the country is exploding with population, God damn it, you have fertility clinics, you need an infertility bomb <laughs> So because I said this, I'm in lot of trouble, now you try drawing me into more trouble <laughs> Yes, uh, this problem again goes back to the first question. This is because you're so horribly identified with your own biology. It has to come out of your body, otherwise it's not yours. It is such a gross way of existence. Unless it comes out of my body, it doesn't belong to me. Well, you're married to a man or a woman, they didn't come out of your body. No, but our bodies are meeting, that's why. See, the identity has become so grossly biological, Unless in some way it's biological interaction, it is not really a relationship. In fact, today everybody, all of you have picked up this words from America. It just used to surprise me, but now that is the usage. If somebody says, I have a relationship, you are supposed to understand that they have a sexual relationship. Well, I have a relationship with you sitting here. This need not be body-based, yes or no. We're looking at each other, do we have a relationship or no? But why only body-based relationships are relationships? Isn't this a relationship? Hello? Your relationship with biology, leave it. Your parents, your brothers, your sisters, leave that. Your friend, is this not a relationship? Huh? Your milkman who comes and pours milk and uh, makes your life going today, is this not a relationship? Isn't your taxi driver a relationship? I'm asking. No, no, you're not supposed to say that if you say relationship, people will assume you're sleeping with them. Yes, unfortunate, isn't it? 
Relationships are of many kinds. Human beings can form varieties of relationships. But right now, unfortunately, we think only if bodies come together or only if something comes out of this body, it's a relationship worthwhile. Other things are not relationships. No, we have to change this language because this is causing a lot of, you know, pain to people because body is the front end. See, body is the front end for every other creature on this planet. The only reason this creature is dominating this planet is not because we have the best body. You're not comparable to an elephant or a tiger or anything for that matter, you're not even as good as a buffalo. <laughs> yes, in terms of strength and physical prowess, you're nowhere comparable. This is dominant because of its intelligence, this is dominant because of its consciousness. But right now, we are creating a world where your biology is the front end of your life, this has to change. Because the biology is the front end of your life, you think your child means it has to come through you. Not that natural child… childbearing process is a bad thing. It is just that if you were a tiger, if you were a tigress, I would say please go to the fertility clinic soon because, uh, you know, it's becoming extinct, huh? <laughs> Their numbers are dwindling and they may disappear, but human beings, huh? Just too many. <laughs> we are nice, but we are too many, aren't we? Hello? We are just too many. In the beginning of twentieth century, we were just 1.6 billion people. Today we are 7.6 billion people in hundred years or four times. But in India, of course, we do better than others. <laughs> 1947, we were 33 crores. Today we are 127 crores. Seventy years? Well, this is not just because of excessive reproduction, because our life expectancy has improved. In forty-seven, our life expectancy was only twenty-eight years of age. Today, it's reached somewhere around sixty-six, which is a phenomenal achievement for the nation. It's great. But what I'm asking is, if you postpone death, should you also not postpone birth? Hello? This is not a philosophy, this is not ideology, this is simple arithmetic. Yes, this is simple arithmetic. If this many people were exiting, you are in a college right now, this year how many people exit, that many people they will admit, isn't it? Doesn't that work for the globe also, for the planet also? This many people exited, so this many people should come in. If you say this, you think, God, you're doing animal husbandry with us? Are you doing Hitler's business? This is what… Oh, this is Nazi talk. Well, you multiply unconsciously, nature will do it in a very cruel way one day. Yes? If we don't consciously take steps as human beings, nature will do it one day in a very cruel manner. And that cruelty won't come like bang like that. It happens slowly. Crushing happens slowly. Already it's happening. Farmers are committing suicide, students are committing suicide, all kinds of people are doing all kinds of things. Why? Somewhere life is becoming hard, isn't it? Though as a generation we have highest levels of comfort and convenience, life is becoming hard simply because of the concentration of population. We are doing all kinds of ecological nonsense, but right now United Nations is making a prediction by 2050, we will be 9.6 billion people. Madam, you have to raise your floor, fifty floors. No, no, this won't be enough. <laughs> fifty floors you must raise because they will be full like ants everywhere. 9.6 billion people. Nobody can live well on this planet. Instead of making a prediction like this, we will be 9.6, why can't we plan? By 2050, we will be 3.5 billion people. Oh, what should we do, what should we do? If you don't do anything, population will go down. 